Good morning, church. How are you? You think? You're like, I think we're good. Well, today's going to be a good day. You're going to receive a message that I believe is going to touch your hearts. And the title for today's message is called The Renewal of the Holy Spirit and How the Holy Spirit Shapes Our View. Now, on the table here, I have some uh, 3D glasses. How many of you have worn 3D glasses before? Yes. Um, I'm going to let you know what they're for later. So stay in suspense. Um, now, we talk about Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Obviously, I know Pastor Dave and Cheryl have been teaching for years and years and years. But we have been in our message series talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. It's not just a distant concept or an abstract idea that we have about God, nor a passive observer that we're talking about in our lives. The Holy Spirit is a real person who is close to us. He is closer to you than the breath in your lungs. He comes and he reveals God to us. He changes our vision. He changes our view. He opens our eyes. And today we're going to talk about how he changes our view. He opens our eyes so that we may see who God is, who we are, and also our view of the world changes as well. Now before we look into ways that the Holy Spirit changes our view... I thought I would briefly expound on what regeneration is, because regeneration, regeneration precedes renewal. And we're going to take a look at uh, Titus today. Regeneration used in two places, Matthew 19, 28, the word regeneration, and Titus. So Titus 3, 4 to 6. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So right there, the word regeneration, and we also have the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for regeneration is palingenesia. So it's made of two words, palin, which means again, or back to, and Genesis, meaning a place or a point in which something begins or originates. Through Jesus Christ, we are brought back to what was lost in the Garden of Eden. At the beginning, our relationship with God broke. There was a separation that took place because of Adam and Eve's rebellious action and attitude. In Christ, we have a new beginning. Adam is also called what? Uh, sorry, Jesus is also called Adam or the second Adam. Why? Because Jesus did what the first Adam could not do. First Adam rebelled. Jesus, as the second Adam, lived a perfect life. And he fulfilled the law and the prophets. And he also took our place on the cross so that we have forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Jesus uses the word regeneration when talking about restoring the world to his lordship and delivering the world from the power and the deception of Satan. This is what Paul writes in Romans 5, 17. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, being Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in this life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Man, that's good news. Because without Christ, there is no hope. Without Christ, there is no going back. There is no going back to fix it. And so through Jesus, we receive a new start, a new beginning. Regeneration is God's sovereign work by the Holy Spirit in imparting new spiritual life to every Christian. This is also called being born again. It's called rebirth, as we read in, in the Gospels. So that means that we are regenerated by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. Folks, there is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. 
And so salvation is through Christ alone, and he's the one who makes us spiritually alive to himself. So after new birth, what happens then? You're regenerated, then renewal starts, right? Regeneration, then renewal. The work of renewing begins. God is not content to provide the means of salvation, forgiveness, and cleansing through the substitutionary death of Jesus, but he actually comes and he indwells us. Wow. Wow. The Holy Spirit is in us for those who believe. The Spirit of God indwells us, making us the temples of the Holy Spirit. He begins a powerful work from the inside out. Christianity is an inside out job, right? He comes in and he changes our heart and then everything else starts to change as well. So it's not do and then change comes, but it's actually believe you become a new person your heart is changed your thoughts your actions your words change and so that's the beauty of the gospel message now this is something we really need to believe and understand as christians do you believe this that you are a new creation in christ that your old self died with jesus I remember when I was baptized, that is a symbol, a sign, a picture of my old Faribourg, Grand and Maromi, that is my name, uh, dying in Christ. When I was baptized, I identify with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. My old self, dead, buried. And as I came out of the water, a new person in Christ standing before you. And so this is what we believe, that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We have been made new. And now he's at work in you and I, and he will not stop until he's done with you. He will not stop until he's done with you. And that is good news because a lot of times we want to stop. <laughs> We're like, no, I don't know. This is too hard. This Christian life. But the Holy Spirit, he's faithful even when we are not. That's what the scripture says. God is faithful even when we are not. And he continues, his mercy and his goodness pursues us all the days of our lives. So we go from regeneration to renewal. And we have to understand regeneration is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so is renewal or sanctification, where you're being washed and cleansed and renewed to become more like Jesus. And that too is by faith. And so... Let's read, there's two places, again, renewal, it's talked about, we we just saw Titus 3. Romans 12, 2 talks about this as well, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by the renewal of your mind, that what? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is a good and acceptable and perfect. Do you want to know the will of God? You got to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and that only happens If you put your faith in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you, and you embrace God as your Lord and Savior, the one who changes and renews your mind. And that takes the using of your mind, and that takes testing and discerning. And so the Spirit of God comes, and he helps us to discern and test, and he renews us. The Greek word for renewing is anakinosis. It means to renovate or renew. Folks, if you're a believer, you're under renovation, (laughs) okay? So let's be gracious to one another, okay? (laughs) We are being renewed, renovated, and this is what God is doing in us. Our spirit is born again. Our minds need to be constantly renewed. Vine's Expository Dictionary defines renewal as this. Listen to this. The adjustment of the moral and spiritual vision and thinking to the mind of God. Oh, that's good. The adjustment of the moral and spiritual vision and thinking to the mind of God, which is designed to have a transforming effect upon the life. I'm coming to these glasses. What is this all about, people? I think you're putting two and two together right now. So we're talking about vision. We're talking about sight, new vision. God gives us new vision. When we become regenerated, he gives us what? New eyes to see. New eyes to see God. New eyes to see ourselves, and also new eyes, sight to see the world. When you put on 3D glasses, what happens? The, as you're watching a movie, uh, the height, the depth, the width changes, right? You're like in it, and it shows you something different. 
If you are wearing glasses right now, which some of you are, you know if you take them off, things look very different, right? <laughs> so that's what God does. He gives us new glasses to see him, to see ourselves, and also to see the world in a different way. And so the Holy Spirit, first point, there are three images that the Holy Spirit brings into our focus for us and helps us to see differently, is that the Holy Spirit renews our image of God. He renews our image of God. And one thing is that we start to recognize that is God is good. Now I got new sight. He gives me new eyes. I see God as good. Not as evil. Not as unjust. Not as someone who's not present with me. But as someone who's very present and close with me. That he is good. And when we say that God is good, we mean that he's the final standard of good. And all that he is and does is good. This means that if God, the supreme being of the universe, is good, then he's also the ultimate standard of good. Where do you get your standard of good? We ultimately get it from God. Thus, good is what God approves as there is no higher standard of good. And how do we know God and his standard of good? By the supernatural power and the revelation, the revealing, the unveiling, the new eyes of, that the Holy Spirit gives us through his, and through his inspired and inerrant word. And so you want to know if God is good? You put your faith in Christ and he gives you completely different sight of God. Now, let, let's run through a few scriptures. You might say, Pastor Fari, where is it that where it says God is good? Well, there's many. There is many scriptures that we could talk about today, but for the sake of time, we're just going to cover a few. Psalm 143.10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Romans 2.4 says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness? Forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. What does God's goodness do? It actually leads us away from sin. It leads us away from rebellion. It leads us to him, toward him. And then Psalm 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Some of you have lost heart because in the land of the li living, it looks like there's more dead than living. It looks like there's no hope. But the fact is, if we believe that God is good, then hope arises that his goodness can prevail. The Holy Spirit will reveal that God is good. Jesus said he will be our teacher. The Holy Spirit teaches us who God is. And in the scripture, we see the inspired word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he's telling us that God is good. And if there's anyone today here and you have experienced pain and trauma and things that made you see God as not good, as the opposite of good. My prayer for you is that you would see him and experience his goodness. Because we can truly see and taste that the Lord is good, right? You can see and taste. You can see God's goodness. You can taste. And again, God's goodness, when it changes us, then he uses us to also bring his goodness to others. So how do most people will know how good God is. Obviously, we look at Jesus, we look at the cross, and we also see the body of Christ, the church, who are to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's not for ourselves, it's for others. So people grab the fruit of the Holy Spirit from your life and taste and see that the Lord is good. And so that is our really job, our task, we have to know that people will experience the goodness of God through us as well. And to truly understand why God is good, we also need to know that we have all fallen short of his glory. And because of our rebellion and sinful nature, God should have nothing to do with us. Yet he does. What? That is the gospel. That's like mind-blowing. God is holy. He is majestic. He is infinite. He's so good. There's no flaw, no sin found in him. And yet he embraces flawed people that have rebelled and treasoned against him. 
That is what Jesus shows as he hangs upon the cross. That God's arms are open to a broken world. And if we embrace him by faith, our eyes are now open to see him, to see ourselves as broken humans in need of salvation who then receive a new heart. The scripture says what? That God himself will take out a heart of stone and he'll replace it with a heart of flesh. So now as Christians, we are a new creation. Our heart is soft toward God. It's not hardened. Our hearts are soft toward God and it beats after him. We have a heart after God. So it's the goodness of God that draws us to him. He saves us from our sinful nature, where our sinful attitudes and actions and words stem from. And also, if God is good, then we also need to understand that he is the supreme standard of goodness and all good stem from him, come from him. He is the source of all good in the world. Matthew 7, 11. 7, 11. Can you get good gifts from 7, 11? I'm not sure. But it does say, Matthew 7, 11, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give all good gifts, good things to those who ask of him? Wow, God gives good gifts to his children. We can expect good things from our father just like my girls do. Layla, my youngest one, she's always looking for gifts. No, (laughs) she's always looking for good things from me, right? Whether it be a hug, love, words of affirmation, ice cream, donut, kebabs. (laughs) She's she's half Persian. Um, So... If I, being evil, (laughs) this is what uh, Jesus said, can give good gifts to my children, how much more will my Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? And in this context, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that God the Father will give the Holy Spirit, that you don't have to be afraid or scared of the Holy Spirit. He will not give you something that will hurt or harm you, but something that will benefit you. God is good. If we were just to say for one simple reason, it's because that is who he is. That is his nature. He is good. Where we, yes, where we run into a problem is if we measure God's goodness in a subjective manner based on what is happening to us. When everything goes right and blessings are flowing, we're like, yeah, God is good. And then suddenly, trial Tribulation, difficulties, losing a job, losing your health. And then suddenly, that's when we're being tested. Our faith is being tested. Do I believe that God is truly good for who he is? Or do I only look toward his hand of what he can give me? Or do I believe that the Father is good and I look for his face rather than always looking for his hand of what he can give me? And so God's goodness doesn't mean good things are always going to happen to us. Remember, we live in a sinful and fallen world. We need to trust that God will use all things, all things, again, to fulfill his purposes for our good, for his glory and for our good. And one of the greatest examples of this, again, is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Something so horrific used for our good. So God is good. And also God is a father. You might have grown up maybe in a family like myself where my dad wasn't um, as present as he should be. He wasn't as loving as he should be. He He didn't show care as he should. He didn't have much unconditional love. It was always conditional. So if I did things right, then maybe I would receive love. And when I became a Christian, my eyes were, my sight was changed. Then now I see my heavenly father as a father, as a good father. I'm like, wow, this is different. And so maybe today, because you've had difficulty growing up with your father, earthly father, or you didn't have your earthly father around, might be difficult to think about, about God being 
a good father. And my prayer is that he would reveal himself as a good father to you. Jesus had a unique relationship with God the Father, and he shared that with his followers. That's the mind-boggling thing. During his time on earth, he was quite clear about this. He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And he said, I and the Father are one. And then John 1, 12, we read, but as many as received him, being Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Wow. We call God our Father because he's given us the right to do so. Not everyone born naturally is a child of God. We are his creation, and we are created in his image, but not everyone is a child of God. And we see this in this verse in John 1, 12. You must be born again supernaturally in order to be a child of God and to call God your father. And so because we are his children, Galatians 4 says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Wow, you can say it to the God of this universe who created all that exists, the stars and the galaxies, every cell in your body, and the reason why I can stand up here and breathe and continue on, the one who sustains all of life, holds all things together, that is the God that we can call Abba, Father. That is amazing. You can call God Abba, Father, because of what Christ did for you. Because God is love, he, was, he will always be a loving father. It will not change. God does more than act good. God is good. And that is why the endearing term Abba, Father, is used. His father is our father. He makes it clear, Jesus. We are related to Jesus in that way. God is addressed as father, and we can call him that. Jesus declared God as his father, and he is teaching us as his disciples to do the same. Father to the fatherless, defender of the widows, this is God. What? Whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free. He gives them joy, but he makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. God is a father to the fatherless, defender of the widows. And then he's calling his people to be the same, right? The church, we see in the New Testament, caring for the orphans, caring for the widows, feeding the poor. And so God calls and gives us a new vision. He says, this is how you should view me, self, and the world. And so being a father, we see God as someone who's personally, emotionally, and even sacrificially involved with us. He wants the best for us. He's a provider. He's a protector, loving, compassionate, faithful, and merciful God. That is the God that we serve. And then the significance of the name Father for God is described very well by J.I. Packer. I'm just going to read a quote from Knowing God. And this is what he writes. You sum up the whole New Testament religion if you describe it as a knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook of life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well. Father is the Christian name for God. And so that is how he changes our view to see him as. And then the second point I'd like to make today is that the Holy Spirit renews our self-image. We are created in the image of God. So when I became a Christian, I'm like, wow, that is different. Christianity is different from any other religion or faith that says that we as humans are made in the image of God, which gives us that type of sacredness to human life. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1.27. 
Much can be said about self-image, but the most important image we must have of ourselves is that we are a child of God created in his image. Both the Hebrew word for image and the Hebrew word for likeness refers to something that is similar but not identical to thing it represents or is an image of. Therefore, we as humans, we are to be like God and we are to represent God. So you as Christians are to be like God, like Jesus, and you are to represent Jesus. However, after the fall of Adam and Eve, we know that God's image was distorted in humans, but not lost. And the good news is that through Christ, we have redemption and a gradual, a progressive recovery of more of God's image. So every day, I'm becoming more beautiful. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, internally, spiritually, we are every day being renewed. Isn't that what Paul says? Externally, we are decaying, right? We're getting older. Wrinkles are coming and stuff. Gray hairs. But internally, we are being built up spiritually. We are gradually in that recovery mode of more of God's image, and at Christ's second coming, we will see a complete restoration of God's image. Hallelujah. That is good news. So when Jesus comes back, you're not going to be like you. You're going to be like him. And that means somebody's got to change. That means you're changing. He's not changing, right? <laughs> you're going to be like him. And so that is amazing to, to note. Now, in the movie The Born Identity, Matt Damon plays Jason Bourne, who's rescued at sea by an Italian fishing boat. With only bullets in his bag and his bank account tattooed on his hip, he sets out to find out who he is. He's on a desperate search to find out who he is. He finds out that he has extraordinary talents in fighting. Again, he's hit, he's hit his head, so he doesn't remember who he is and what he can do. So he's lost his identity. But he finds out that he has extraordinary talents in fighting, linguistics, self-defense. And he's on this desperate search to find out who he is and why so many people want him dead. The only way he can survive is really to find out his identity, who he is. In one essence, he's sitting, in one scene, he's actually sitting in a restaurant. He asks a woman, he says, who am I? And a lot of people today are asking the same question. Maybe you're watching online today. You're saying, who am I? Why am I here? Why do I exist? Maybe you're sitting here in the pew and you're like, who am I? And another question to ask is, whose am I? Whose am I? Our most fundamental identity is that of bearing the image of God, that we belong to him, we're made by him. If we don't know or believe this, that we're made by the infinite and holy God, the one and only God, made in his own image, in his likeness, and we are accountable to him as a reasoning, relational, moral, and spiritual being, what's going to happen? Then we're going to live our lives spiritually lost, confused, disconnected, and dissatisfied. And we're going to try to fill that identity by following hollow and empty philosophies and false teachings of the world trying to teach us who we are. And none of that is going to satisfy unless you come to Jesus. All of creation reflects something of God, but we alone bear his image. We are creatures endowed with the highest identity. Now listen, this is important to note and to know, especially if you're a new believer. You have a spiritual enemy. We all do. Jesus faced him as well. He is the accuser. He is called the devil. Satan, or we also call, more accurately, the shaitan. He is the accuser. That is his title. It's not his name. He's the accuser of the brethren. What he does, he tempts. 
and then he condemns. He tempts, he accuses, he condemns before God. That is what his plan and his task is, to steal, kill, and destroy. He will question God's love for you. He will undermine and confuse you and your identity. He will question whether you were born into the right body. He confuses people to believe that God doesn't create humans in his own image, male and female. He will question and bring doubt to what God has already done for us in the finished work of Christ and the beautiful future and the hope that we have in Christ. He will whisper in your ear, are you really a child of God? Are you really loved by God? This is what happened to Jesus 40 days after he was baptized as he was led into the wilderness. Do you guys remember that story? John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. Now when the tempter came to him, being Jesus, he said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are a child of God, he will tell you. He will challenge our identity as he did to Jesus And we know that God the Father, when Jesus was baptized, declared his love for his son. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And folks, that is who you are in Christ. When you become a Christian, you literally are in Christ. And God sees you in Christ as spiritually flawless. And that is why you can worship and go into God's presence boldly. Not because you're so amazing. (laughs) Or that's not why. It's because Jesus is so amazing. He's flawless. He's perfect. He made a way for us. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so this is where we find our identity. The Holy Spirit is there in those times to help us like Jesus We must respond with the word of God. Jesus did that. Our identity determines our destiny, determines how we act. It determines what we do with our lives. And the third point is using, talking about the Holy Spirit renewing our image of the world. So we see the world differently. We see one another differently. I would have never probably found myself in downtown Eastside working closely with those who are struggling with alcohol and homelessness and mental illness and crime because I got new glasses on. I see the world differently and I know that God loves the world, that he sent his son and then he sent his people. We are the sent ones. So this is how we see. We wanted to have hope in a world that is hopeless. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you find yourself hopeless today? Come to Jesus. Do you you find yourself without hope because of what's going on in your own life or what you see all around the world? Put your trust in him and you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who fills our hearts. Dig into his word. Look up scriptures that will feed your faith and starve your doubts. Do it. Go this week. Look up all the scriptures about God being good. God giving hope. God God giving peace. God giving joy. All of the things we're looking for and the world is looking for is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Nowhere else. Tim Hansel in the book Holy Sweat tells the story of Clarence Jordan. Let's put up a picture of Clarence Jordan. He's the co-founder of Habitat for Humanity. And this is what he, one of his quotes. It is not enough to limit your love to your own nation, to your own group. You must respond with love even to those outside of it. The concept enables people to live together. Not as nations, but as the human race. Clarence Jordan was a man of unusual abilities and commitment. He had two PhDs, one in agriculture and then also in Greek and Hebrew. He could have done anything he wanted, really. He was gifted. He chose to serve the poor. And this was in the 1940s. 1940s, he founded a farm in Georgia, in the United States, and called it 
Koinonia Farm. It was a community for poor whites and poor blacks working together. And as you can imagine, such an idea didn't really go well in the deep south in the 40s. Ironically, much of the resistance came from some good church people, church people, followed the laws of segregation as much as the other folk in town. The town people tried anything to stop Clarence. They tried boycotting him, slashing workers' tires when they came in town over and over again for 14 years. Man, Clarence had a different vision of God being good, self-image, and also of the world. Finally, in 1954, the Ku Klux Klan had enough of Clarence Jordan, so they decided to get rid of him once and for all. They came one night with guns and torches and set fire to every building on the farm, but Clarence's home, they riddled with bullets. And they chased off all the family except one black family who refused to leave. And Clarence recognized the voices that night. He recognized the voices of the many Klansmen, and as you might guess... Some of them were church people. Another was the local newspaper reporter who came the day after, pretending like, you know, he wasn't there last night. He comes next day. The reporter came out to see what remained of the farm, and the rubble still smoldered. The land was scorched, but he found the Clarence in the field, hoeing and planting. I heard the awful news, the reporter said, <laughs> and I came out to do a story on this strategy tragedy of your farm closing. Clarence just kept on hoeing and planting. The reporter kept prodding, kept poking, trying to get a rise from this quietly determined man who seemed to be planting instead of packing his bags. Well, Dr. Jordan, you got two of them PhDs and you got 14 years in this, to this farm and there's nothing left of it at all. Just how successful do you think you've been? Clarence stopped towing, turned toward the reporter with his penetrating blue eyes and said quietly but firmly, about as successful as the cross. Sir, I don't think you understand us. What we're about is not success, but faithfulness. We are staying. Good day, sir. This was his response to the reporter. And beginning that day, Clarence and his companions rebuilt Cononia and the farm and is still going strong today. Clarence had the pneuma glasses, the spirit glasses, the spiritual eyes that God had given him. His eyes had been opened by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. And today, Jesus is giving an invitation to everyone to respond by faith to his offer of salvation and start following him and to know that he will lead you to good places and he will give you the power, the spiritual power and sight to follow after him. And if that's you today, I'd love to lead you in a time of prayer. And you can repeat this prayer after me and then right after we're going to go into our time of communion. So this prayer is really come, will come from the heart where the Holy Spirit moves, you hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, bringing transformation so you can vocalize your faith to God. And here you can repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent and turn away from my sins. And I ask you to come into my life and take control. Today, I make a commitment to follow Jesus all the days of my life. And I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.